Welcome everybody to our webinar this afternoon. Today we are covering the topic of compliance and specifically privacy and data protection. My name is Holly Jervis and I'm the Customer Experience Leader for Chess Partner. But today it's not only me taking you through the steps of compliance, instead we have our Head of Compliance, Sandra Lovell Struthers, or Head of Quality and Compliance, she gets a very fancy title, uh, who's going to break it down a little bit more for you and give you some information that may help you when you're reviewing things such as your privacy policies, terms and conditions, uh, and anything to do with your website and displaying accurate inf information on compliance to your customer base. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Sandra. Thank you for your time today, Sandra. Thanks, Holly. Uh, yeah, looking forward to it. So today I'm going to try and take you through, through some hints and tips of how to deal with uh, compliance issues, mainly all to do with data protection and the hated GDPR, um, covering over some myths that are not true and highlighting some truths that you do need to consider. So the benefits, the benefits of doing it right. Well, obviously it's gonna help your organization to comply with its legal obligations. It looks scary. It's not as scary as it looks. It will actually save your organization time and effort in the long run, because it basically allows you to manage all these things. Once you get your systems and your processes in place, it makes it very easy. I think one of the biggest benefits of all is it will build good relations with anybody that you deal with. And once they have confidence that you are dealing with their information in a secure fashion, then your relationship is only ever going to flourish. The risks of doing it wrong. Um, these are a little bit more scary. Most people now know that the big fines that the ICO is allowed to um, enforce are now coming into being. So recently we've had British Airways 183 million, Marriott Hotels 99 million. These are huge organizations with a huge global turnover. So they are going to get these maximum sort of fines. The biggest thing I can say is as long as you are following a privacy program, and you are trying to put your security in place and you inform the ICO when things go wrong, which we'll go into a little bit later, then the risks of doing it wrong are not to be feared. The biggest thing alongside the financial risk is your reputational risk. So again, the ICO may come along and give you an order to follow or a fine. However, it's your reputational costs of losing your customers that is always going to be the biggest consequence of getting it wrong. The suggestions, I'm hoping that some of the suggestions will help your organizations understand the benefits of um, complying with these information laws. It's a point to note that anyone dealing with chess, whether you're suppliers, customers or partners, we would always expect you to be fully compliant with any privacy legislation. Again, it's a point to note that registering or paying a fee, as it's now known, is required by law. If you deal with any sort of personal identifiable information, however, there are exemptions and I'll go on to those a little bit later. So what is personal identifiable information? Everybody talks about it. It's basically that quote there, any information alone or in combination that can I be used to specifically identify a person. I think everybody realizes that we're talking about names, addresses and telephone numbers. What a lot of people tend to forget is email addresses, especially if they think their email address refers to their business. So I've given an example below. So for example, Flowers Are Us Limited is not personal identifiable information. However, if your flower shop is called Joe Blogs and your name is Joe Blogs, then it is PII. So we just need to take that extra little bit of time, read into the names, look at the stuff we're keeping and decide for ourselves, does this identify an individual? 
The exemptions that I mentioned, you may be exempt from the fee if you only process information for the following. So staff administration, payrolls, etc., accounts, invoices and payments and advertising or marketing if it's about your own activity only. However, and this is the biggest catch all, if you use CCT on the CCTV on the premises for any crime prevention purposes, you will still need to pay a fee. And irrespective of whether you need to pay that fee or not, or whether you're exempt from it, you still by law need to comply with all the data protection rules. And that includes the Data Protection Act 2018 and the General Data Protection Regulation or GDPR as we all know it by. If you hold such information, such as personal identifiable information, these are the things you need to consider. So have you thought what information comes in and out of your business? Um, does it appertain to your customers only or does it appertain to employees that you may or may not have? Are you talking just about names and addresses of customers? Or do you keep names and addresses of suppliers and people that you deliver goods to or people that you receive goods from? Do you know why you collect it? How long you keep it? And have you made a record of the types of personal data you hold, what you do with it and why you hold it? This is what we call a processing register. If we do hold such information, people have the right to know how we keep it, why we keep it and what we keep. So do you tell people how you use their personal data? Do you tell people if you're going to share their data? If you don't, you need to plan how you're going to do that. If you've got a website, the obvious thing to do is set up a privacy notice or a privacy statement and put it on your website. If you don't use a website, then a leaflet or a poster in your premises, in your shop is absolutely fine and perfectly adequate. Do we collect the data that we need? This is about excessive data. Do we only collect the information we absolutely need to work with? Long gone are the days where we need to know everybody's shoe size and their preference and their favorite colors. We don't need to know those things anymore. It's much easier to manage your information if you only keep what you need and a small amount of it. Make sure that yourself and the people you work with know the difference between the information you need as a company and a business and information that's optional. Likewise, when you're collecting this information, make it quite clear to the customer that this information we absolutely need to be able to retain and hold your records. However, this bit of information is optional and you don't have to give it to us. Do you only keep this personal data for as long as necessary? This is your retention policy. You should at any point have a retention policy and be able to explain that to your customers and the people that you keep this information on. Have you decided on how long that's going to be? Where do you keep it? Do you refresh or destroy the personal data after a specific period of time? Um, for example, on the bottom, Peter is a news agent. He collects names and addresses of his customers as well as all their orders and payments. He creates a document that de details exactly what he keeps and how long he holds it for. At the end of that period, he securely destroys that data and he annually checks it for accuracy. You need to be able to ensure that you have that process in place for all the information you keep. How long you're gonna keep it for, how you're going to destroy it and you need to be able to supply that information to anyone who asks for it. Do we keep our information accurate and up to date? It's all very well to take this information in when we first meet a customer, but that customer can move house, change telephone numbers, uh, move business addresses, all of these things. We need to be able to regularly check 
that the personal data we're holding about these individuals is accurate and up to date. I think one of the most important things is if that individual wants to see a copy of it, we'll go into that later, you need to be able to find it quickly to be able to make sure it is up to date. If you don't keep your records in order, you're not going to be able to find that information quickly, if at all. Do you keep this personal data secure? We all think we keep a secure environment. When we go home at night, we lock the office, we lock the shop premises, we lock the business premises. But are we actually locking that personal data away somewhere? It needs to be away using a lockable filing cabinet, lockable desks, drawers. Do you take steps to keep that safe when you're popping out for lunch or popping out for a quick coffee? At any point, your premises may not be as secure as you think. Likewise, continuing on personal data and secure. Do you keep your electronic data secure? So you've got email addresses, you've got your computer security. Is that locked with an adequate password and not just password, password one, two, three? Do you make sure that you're not sharing your passwords with all of your employees and that you each have individual lock-ons? If you're working from home, do you ensure that your home environment has the same security as your working environment and that you adopt the same clear desk policy when you're at home as you do when you're in the office or the business environment? People's rights. Do you have a way for people to exercise their rights regarding their personal data? So we mentioned that we're only going to keep it for so long. And we've mentioned that you may need to go in there and change it for accuracy. But individuals have rights regarding their data under the law. One of them being subject access requests, which is the main one. People can write in or verbally ask at any point for a copy of everything you hold about them. There are limitations and there are rules of which we have to apply when someone asks for a subject access request. Are you ready? Is your business geared up to deal with a subject access request? With the new law that's come into place, the time span to answer a subject access request has recently been reduced. It now states that you have to achieve this within a calendar month. So, for example, if the request comes in on the 3rd of September, you have to reply by the 3rd of October. That's not a lot of time if you don't know exactly where this data is held. So it's all about keeping good records securely in a place you know where it is. Likewise, someone may ask to get their data deleted. Again, you cannot delete their records if you don't know where they are and that they're easily accessible. And remember, this applies not just to computerized records, but to paper records also. Rights and the individuals have under the law. I'm not going to go through each and every one. There's a much better explanation on the ICO's website, which we'll give you the details of a little later. But basically, it's the right to be informed. So as we said, everybody should know that you are holding their information and for what reason. The right of access, as we've just said, a subject access request. I may write in and say, can I have a copy of everything you've got? The right to rectification. It's inaccurate now. I've moved house. You need the right to be able to write in and rectify that information. The right to erasure. I'm no longer dealing with you and yet you're still holding my records for approximately 10 years, for example. I have the right to write into you or to speak to you and say, I want my records erased now, please. The right to restrict processing. Again, I might want you to keep my records because I'm having services from you, but I might not want marketing information or survey information from you. So again, it's allowing that individual the right to restrict the processing and decide what they want from you. The right to data portability. 
if you have records, that individual has the right for them to be easily accessible so they can move to another supplier or another service. And the right to object. Again, they can object to the way that you are processing their information. If you do hold such information, you need to know that it's not just yourself, but every single member of your staff, if you have any, to know exactly what your data protection responsibilities are. You as a data controller or a main data processor will be responsible for anybody that deals with or processes your data. So have you trained all your staff who handle personal data on their responsibilities? It is your responsibility to make sure that everybody within your remit is trained. A data breach. We've heard lots about this in the news. We've heard lots about it on the television, especially with these big fines that's now about. Do you actually know what a data breach is? And do you know what to do about it if you think you've done one? A data breach is basically anything that goes wrong with the holding of this information, and that can be accidental or intentional. Destruction, loss, alter alteration, or unauthorized disclosure of. Again, there are very simple steps and guidelines on the ICO's website to deal with it. Do not put your head in the sand and pretend it hasn't happened. Go to the ICO's website, fill out a form, and they can advise you further. This is a follow on from that. So do you know which breaches you need to actually report to the ICO? Again, if you follow through their website and do an assessment form, it will tell you whether this particular breach or incident needs reporting to them or certain ones don't. It's basically all about the impact that that loss or destruction may have on an individual. And those assessment tools on the ICO website will help you decide whether or not it's a breach that you need to report or not. The last bit about data breaches is this law now extends to individuals. So not only do we have to report breaches to the ICO, but we potentially need to inform the individuals whose data we've lost or destroyed that we've done that. Again, it's not in every case. It depends on the impact. So potentially, if we lost a piece of paper with 10 customers' names, addresses and telephone numbers on that, we should be considering whether or not we need to contact these 10 people and say to them, we've lost your information, we've lost your data. Again, if in doubt, if you're not sure or you need further help, go to the ICO website, follow their guidance, do an assessment or give them a ring. They would be more than happy to talk you through the next steps of what you need to do. That's, that's it really, that's all I've got to say today. Um, I didn't want to bombard this session with too much. I wanted to give hints and tips. As I keep saying throughout the session, for further information, go to the ICO website, ico.org.uk. They have got some great assessment tools there. They've got some good advice for small and medium businesses. Lots of hints and tips and lots of frequently asked questions. Um, certainly, if you're a customer or um, a partner of ours, you've got Holly here and I'm sure that she'd be happy to help. And again, point her towards us so that we may be help, able to help you further. Thanks, Holly. Thank you, Sandra. It, that's extremely informative. I think, um, you know, I speak for quite a lot of people when it comes to the word compliance, um, it, we can tend to get a bit panicked, um, perhaps deer in headlights, because it does seem quite a sprawling subject. Ultimately, our partners need to know that there is a responsibility from their business to their end user, as much as there is a responsibility from Chess to our partners. So, as you said, don't bury your head in the sand. If there is something you need to get going on, perhaps you need to revise your terms and conditions. Perhaps you need to look at that privacy notice on your website or 
if you're still not sure, it's okay. We're certainly not going to judge you. We just want to help. So as uh, as you can see on the screen in front of you, we have got Sandra's details if you would like to contact her. She's an extremely busy lady, but she's also a very lovely lady. So I'm sure she will help you if she possibly can. You can also contact myself which majority of you watching this you will have my details if you don't by now next time i visit you they are going in your phone but ultimately you can reach out to us and we will certainly guide you towards what you need to be doing in addition to this since we have recorded this webinar we have now got a compliance resources list which helpfully lists the ico's website and it also gives links to government guidance on things such as anti-bribery uh, gdpr and uh, gdpr and a bit more in depth uh, from the government side of things as well as the ico and we also have as well some clarification on the ofcom regulation change from gc23 uh, on mobile and GC24 fixed line. And what that changed to is it changed in October last year and uh, we've had quite a few questions about it. So we have a little summary on there to help you work your way through it. If you'd like a copy of that, then please do ask or send that over to you. And uh, of course, anything that you need assistance with, we are more than happy to help. The only thing we cannot do is we cannot offer you any templates to complete terms and conditions or privacy notices, but we are more than happy to review what you've completed. So that's it for this month's webinar. Next month, it's under wraps. It doesn't mean I don't know what's going on. It possible, possibly could. Um, but uh, it's currently something that I'm working on. So hopefully it'll be ready to go in October. So more on that in the marketing bulletins. But next month's Chess Chat will come from Kerry Lendon, Customer Services Director for Chess Partner. That will be a live webinar and you can get your questions in. But today, thank you once again to Sandra for your time and so eloquently explained some of the uh, more nitty-gritty sides of GDPR. Thanks, Sandra. Thanks, Holly. And we'll see you next month.